Hello and welcome to Bend the Knee, a Song of Ice and Fire podcast. I am Sir Matt, the Bud Knight. And I am Sir Jimmy of House Nuts. Welcome to our Song of Ice and Fire book club. Today, we are into, well, something a bit different. We're not covering a chapter today. We're not even covering House of the Dragon News, but we are accompanied by a wonderful guest, one of my very good friends from the YouTube sphere, and that is Joanna from Joanna reads what resonates there, there's there was a name change at some point back in the day um <laughs> you know different eras i would say but uh joanna is a wonderful wonderful booktuber over on youtube and does all types of book reviews and bookish content i would say also video essays that uh pertain to fantasy a lot of the time and we are very privileged for you to join us today how are you joanna Oh, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I, it's such a pleasure to talk about this series anytime. So I'm super, super thrilled to have this conversation. Yeah, I know uh, me and Matt were excited because, you know, we go back and forth all the time. Like I know most of Matt's opinions on the series. He knows most of mine. So when we get a fresh voice in here to talk about A Song of Ice and Fire, it's always a, a really good time. Um, you are rereading the series right now. And mm -hmm. for the first time in a decade, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I read the five books um, right around the time the first season of the show came out, around that time. Uh, so it's been a while, and I had forgotten a ton, but I loved it then, and I'm just, I'm having the best experience rereading it right now. That is awesome. And you just finished A Feast for Crows, if I'm not mistaken, today. Yes, I just finished it today, and I loved it. I was just saying right before we went live that I... I don't think I love A Feast for Crows less than A Storm of Swords. <laughs> it is a very different reading experience. And so I think maybe there might be an adjustment there because you are given so many different parts of the world, um, introduced to so many different side characters all at once. But I was, I was just mesmerized. I was just hypnotized by the experience. I thought it was so captivating. So good. So good. Yeah, I... Uh... I mean, I know I love A Feast for Crows. Matt, how do you feel about A Feast for Crows? Uh, you know, uh, A Feast for Crows is, if I had to pick, it's, I, I think only because it's the shorter book, mm -hmm. I kind of falls maybe to the backside of, of like the books where I'm like, oh, I really want to dive into it. But A Feast for Crows is so interesting character wise. Oh, yeah. Because you get the Sam chapters and you get the Cersei chapters, which are some of my absolute favorite in you know the whole series, because it's one of the things I love where we're at in our podcast right now, rereading every chapter is we're. You know, when you hit a storm of swords, you get the first Jamie chapter, which I've often described as like probably my second favorite chapter in the whole series, just because you've been hearing about this character, you've never gotten that internal monologue and once you start to get the Cersei internal monologue like your perception of her changes <laughs> so much because you really get to sort of realize wow Robert Baratheon was not really <laughs> like the best guy and she had to deal with all of that and so it's just it's just such an interesting take and the Sam chapters as well so I mean there's only five books so I love them all differently you know mm -hmm. I don't really know that I have I mean I have, I guess, to put one up. I mean, A Storm of Swords is my favorite. But, I mean, it's hard. To, I mean, if I say A Feast is my least favorite, it's not because I don't think it's a great book. It's right. just, it's just because it's the shorter one. It's the, so that's where it falls for me. <laughs> also has to super, you know, has to secede the uh, book of the the last maybe 30 Storm. years in the fantasy genre. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do to follow up Storm of Swords, but you kind of have this massive crescendo. And then after that, you know, you have to somehow bridge to the next one. So in a lot of ways, I've always said that A Feast for Crows is the beginning of the next arc in A Song of Ice and Fire, which would consist of A Feast for Crows, Dance of Dragons, and then The Winds of Winter should wrap that up. And then we have our our ultimate book, right? Uh, a Dream of Spring, which we may or may not ever see. Um, but yeah, Joanna, uh, 10 years is a long time. What yes. were you, I, I, and this is, this is maybe asking a lot, but I'm curious, how did you feel about A Song of Ice Fire when you first read it? Like when you very- Oh, first... I loved it. I loved it. Um, I, I was completely blown away because I knew some very smart people that were into the series who were longtime fans of the series. And oh, I considered right. those two friends uh, much smarter than I was at the time. So I thought, 
I'm going into this and I'm just going to read the first book super, super slowly. I'm going to take my time. And I kept saying, oh, by the time I finish the fifth book, I'm sure the sixth one will come out because I'm going to read it that slowly. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, I think it, I got to a page, I got around almost a hundred pages into the book. It was Bran's chapter when he's like exploring the castle in the first book. That was the chapter where I suddenly felt hooked. And not even with what happens at the end of that chapter, just starting that chapter, I was completely hooked. I was immersed. And the next thing I knew, I was just flying through all five books. And I loved it so much that I re recommended it to my dad. And my dad had never read a fantasy book in his life. He'd only read like John Grisham and mysteries and <laughs> suspense thrillers. And he flew through the five books in no time too. And kept on asking me like, Joanna, what is it with his like Mexican accent? When is Martin coming out with the next book? <laughs> I said, sorry, dad. <laughs> yeah. Never. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. But I, I was so, I was so blown away. It was such a special time. I mean, I remember racing home from work just to read the books. I was so, I was so immersed in it. Yeah. I think uh, the, the story of someone, you know, like your father, not really being into fantasy books, but checking out a song of ice and fire is, is pretty common. I mean, me, me and Matt have talked about this multiple times. Uh, Matt, Matt likes certain series, but he's not like me wherever, like if it's it published and it's in fantasy, I'm probably going to read it. Like I'm going to try it. Uh, Matt's a lot more selective, you know, I'm more of a whimsical reader, I guess. And yeah, I think that's a pretty common thread for, for a lot of people. And it is a series that you see, like it, you see people getting people who don't even read, not just not fantasy, but not reading in general. Uh, it's responsible for the reason why I'm here, but also why I have a booktube channel and why I read all these books is just trying to find the next A Song of Ice and Fire, which is, uh, I've not. Will there it. ever be one? You know, I, mean, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I know exactly what you mean, though, because I remember after um, experiencing it the first time, just wanting to have another experience like that and just struggling for years to find another fantasy series that could do for me what this series did. Mm -hmm. So now that it's been 10 years and, you know, you're going to be going into A Dance of Dragons, which I think is just fantastic uh, to no one's surprise. What has your experience been like this time and how is it different? Yeah, um, it's. It's interesting because I I love it just as much. It's just a different experience. Uh, there's something about reading it the first time when you don't know what's going to happen, especially if you got the opportunity to read it before watching the show and before the show became popular, especially with book three, which I know we're going to talk about. But um, I think there's also something that's so special for me about rereading the book. And it's just re bringing back a lot of that nostalgia, a lot of those previous feelings and at the same time, I realized reading it now, because when I read it the first time, I didn't actively read it and not saying that I'm the most active reader this time around, but I could tell that I missed so many things in plain sight the first time I read it, just so many details. And so this time around, I'm like, whoa, there's like foreshadowing for book three all the way at the beginning of book one. And, you know, just seeing things like that, just seeing the foreshadowing, um, and paying attention to new details I couldn't really pick up on the first time. So I think it's a special experience for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we lost Jimmy there for a second. Maybe he'll he'll pop back in. But yeah, it is. And A Feast is also such an interesting book because obviously it's the split, right, of A Feast and A Dance of Dragons where, you know, he sort of wrote them side by side and we get you know, it's just, it's, they go in different directions, right? Like one of the chapters I love because it really is the only time I think we see it in the entire series is the Sam chapter where Sam gets to meet now Lord Commander Jon Snow. And you actually in A Dance of Dragons, you get the same conversation that Sam has with Jon. You get it from Jon's perspective in A Dance of Dragons. I think it's the only time that anything, anything like that happens. And it's also another thing I love about it is you get this like I, we talked a little bit um, you know before about like the the Cersei chapters is like we get the 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 Tyrion fallout of everything that happened with him is now handled by Cersei. So it's like we get this different perspective of everything that's going on in the realm from all of these like characters who maybe didn't have as much screen time. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's it's just it's what I love about George Martin. 
is the gray characters and the way he the characters he chooses to portray these big events that like when you watch in the show like take the battle of the blackwater for example i love the sequence in a clash of kings that is the battle of the blackwater because of the people he chooses to tell you where he starts out with davos and they're sailing over and then you have Tyrion waiting for the ships to come over and everything's on fire and then he cuts to sansa back in the throne room and everyone's freaking out it's just so good i love just the way, especially in this book, too, that we get a lot of the fallout of the big events from A Storm of Swords by all of these different characters. It's just, it's so, while establishing them now as good characters, it's like pure genius, to be entirely honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember even the first time I read it, just uh, when it came to A Feast for Crows and uh, A Storm, I think it had with dragons as well. I have forgotten so much of A Dance with Dragons, so I'm really excited to revisit that one. But I remember just living for Cersei's chapters. And so that was such a treat to <laughs> reread those chapters again and to get that perspective, like you said, of uh, Lord Commander Snow from uh, Samuel Tarly's perspective. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how he does that. And it's amazing how he makes some of the most despicable characters still have something about them that's sympathetic uh, to the reader. So I'd greatly appreciated that. How are you, uh, how are you feeling now that you finished Feast uh, about Cersei? Do you find her to be a tragic character? Oh, her character. I'm still trying to process that because the whole time there's something about Cersei's chapters. Um, and I think I felt this way the first time I read the book. Uh, there's something about her chapters that felt so psychologically taxing for me <laughs> I just felt so stressed out reading her chapters so stressed out uh so I feel like even though she is just vile at times like just so she seems to lack she seems kind of almost hypocritical in the way that she um doesn't seem to feel empathy for people going through what she went through and I don't know, just her storyline is so interesting to me. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, I I feel for her a little bit. And I, I he just, Martin has this way of just doing things every now and then, like showing how much he re she really does love Tommen, for example, yeah. how much she really does love her, her children. Um, and the way she actually shows, especially at the end of, can I spoil things for Arby's for Crows? In oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Even like her relationship with Tana... Mary Merryweather is it Merryweather? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was an interesting dynamic, and I'm still questioning uh, Tana and her motivations. And at the same time, it seemed to me clear that uh, even though Cersei was very self-serving in that friendship, there was still a part of her that I think maybe cared about her a little tiny bit. So there were just little things like that that kind of showcased just tiny threads to make her more human, even though she was just being horrible to Marjorie, just totally yeah. careless. Yeah. The worst, you know, <laughs> trying to slander her, you know, after so much has been said about her and what she's done in the past, just ha having no sympathy <laughs> at all for doing that to somebody else. I will say that a very large portion of our one star reviews on iTunes are uh, from people being upset that we've ever defended Cersei in any right whatsoever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, a lot of Cersei hate. Yeah, because yeah. I vehemently defend her. I'm not saying she's a good person, but, you know, I mean, a lot of the things she does, she does on behalf of her family and her children. And then in Feast, when you really get to dive a lot more into her psyche, I mean, she's like torching uh you know the red keep because she thinks Tyrion's hiding in the walls and he's gonna come out of the walls and like kill her kids oh. i mean she's yeah. it's i mean it's crazy and then you, you know when she talks about uh when she's uh, i always forget her name but she's when she's with the dornish woman and she talks about how like robert would just come in and kind of have his way with her and then you're like you know you begin to feel bad and you know that even though she'd still had this whole plan of she wanted to still be with jamie 
you know, Robert Baratheon is like this young, handsome king who and she's now the queen and he wants literally nothing to do with her whatsoever. Yeah. So you begin to dive into her psyche a little bit and understand at least and come to some reason as to why she does the things she does. Yeah, that and also her experience as a child, whenever she would dress up like Jamie and experience what it was like, how differently people would treat her Huge. when they thought she was a male, you know? Right. Yeah, so there, people... There's actually some really interesting feminist themes, I think, that come up, comes up in her character, her storyline, and in general in A Feast for Crows and Brienne's as well. So I think that's, yeah, there's a lot that could be unpacked there. So it's, I definitely uh, am with you on having some wanting to defend her at least in part you know some parts of her i just can't <laughs> i'm like i don't know i think but she, she might have gone too far <laughs> but she wants to uh have the seamstress quartered because that she's convinced they're making her clothes too tight when she's just gaining weight from all the drinking it's like right. one of my favorite parts of the entire series <laughs> yeah yeah um, just the way she she believes everyone is out to get her every single person mm -hmm. It's like the opposite of Ned, who's so trusting that everybody thinks the way he does. I guess that's kind of like a theme that you see throughout the series are characters who believe other characters think the way they do. Yeah. So if it's a character who has honor and, you know, respect for things and then they'll assume the best in people and assume that they will think the way they do. Brienne assumes that people believe in justice the way she does. And then, uh, you know, Cersei believes everyone is out to get her because that's how she is, you know, and it's all just like a projection in a way. We see the worst in, in, uh, in other people. I think it's um, James Joyce who has a beautiful line about like uh, through our lives, we'll see grandsons, fathers, uncles, aunts, and but always ourselves, like at the end, always ourselves. It's something like that. It's from Ulysses. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a quote that I haven't actually read all of Ulysses because I don't want to torture myself with it but uh <laughs> that quote i think is like really valid and i think that george is showing that through uh different perspectives it's also just interesting in a story where he kind of challenges us to see things from different perspectives uh we just see characters seeing the worst or the best or thinking the best of, of other characters not not much of that grayness that we talk about they see the world in black and white a lot of the times uh which is certainly a a lesson for us to take away when we read a song of ice and fire uh another lesson that george and george is constantly recycling these things throwing different spins on them putting a different lens on them but one of the re reoccurring themes in a song of ice and fire is the danger of prophecy and of mm -hmm. unquestionable belief stannis baratheon and melisandre are clearly an example of this but uh, um for cersei maggie the frog is this uh you know maggie the frog is is basically in a way taken away the ability for Cersei to make certain decisions because she's always questioning when it's going to happen, what will lead to that, who will be part of that downfall. Um, I think Maggie the Frog is super important to, to Cersei's entire character arc, really. Yeah. And real, and real quick here, one thing, you know, you talked about with like Cersei and perhaps like, you know, some, some of the feminine, like, you know, feminist issues coming up in this book, which I guess, you know, I, it is interesting but I just did a check here because I'm like, you know, this book's only 45, 46 if you count the prologue chapters. This entire book is actually almost entirely from a P, uh, from a female POV uh, mm -hmm. because there's 46 chapters, including the prologue. You have 10 Cersei chapters, eight Brienne chapters. There's technically three Sansa chapters because it switches from this is where he also began the like chapters being titled things other than just like a name where it's like you know the captain of the guards and things like that so you have sansa and then two elaine chapters there's two aria chapters there's a uh ariana martell chapter so, so i would like probably 70 percent of this book uh is other than really the sam and jamie chapters is actually almost entirely a female uh driven book which i guess i've never really like looked at the numbers to uh mm -hmm. to think about that yeah, I hadn't actually didn't I didn't know that chapter breakdown. That's very interesting. And in some ways, also, uh, if you want to take a look at the masculine side of this book, Samuel Tarley is not the hero in shining armor. And Jamie once was uh, and then was ridiculed for it and then lost his hand. And now he's taking on like a whole different role as well. Uh, there's a lot about identity uh, in the series, but in Feast for Crows specifically, especially. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Also, one little thing about Cersei before we, you know, if we want to move on to something else. Uh, she didn't murder her friend when she was a child, by the way. <laughs> she did murder, uh, murder. Uh, what was her name? Malaria? Oh. Malera? Right. Heather, mm -hmm. Heather Spoon, uh, whenever they go to Maggie, because she asked, uh, Malera asked Maggie the frog. She said, not Jamie, uh, or will I marry Jamie? And Maggie says, not Jamie, nor any other man. Worms will have your maiden head. Your death is here tonight, little one. Can you smell her breath? She is very close. And that would be Cersei. Cersei was, this, was death. I just think that's another important thing to keep in mind uh, mm -hmm. in might be some inbreeding down that line as well like <laughs> i don't know what's going on in this lannister family tree uh it, it's not good it's not good at all no. yeah i loved by the way in a feast for crows that we got to learn or got to um meet some more lannisters yeah. <laughs> uh genna i think that was my favorite i loved her so much and then i think it was is it david or darian i cannot remember it was interesting just to see their dynamics of, you know, how broad their family is, how much reach they have and mm -hmm. uh, the influence of Tywin too. And so, yeah, there was a lot of interesting things with that, but that's such an interesting observation about the chapter breakdown again. I just have to. <laughs> yeah, I've, been, I, I've been, I've been on this big, like over analytical statistical breakdown of, of the Matt loves numbers lately. Yeah. I've been, I, well, there's so much, once you start diving into it, let me tell you, there's like some crazy things we've been uncovering about mm -hmm. the, the like the just the date like the data breakdown because it doesn't go at all how you think it would so like and now i'm gonna have to now i'm gonna this is gonna be my next breakdown is like a feast for crows and like the female side of it because like we just did oh. this big thing about uh john snow where i broke down like every time john snow either appears has his own chapter appears in a chapter or is mentioned in a chapter and one of the interesting things we came we came across was that I would you would assume, I guess, in thinking of like the other uh, other point of view characters where John would be mentioned. And we were thinking, well, it's probably going to be Arya because anytime Arya grabs needles, she's probably going to think, OK, this is the sword from my brother. And we actually uncovered that Jon Snow is almost in every single brand chapter uh, in some way or another. And so now that mm -hmm. just is sending us on this like huge thing. So now this is going to be my next thing is going to be. <laughs> A, fe a feast for crows because now i'm just like oh yeah this is interesting <laughs> yeah if, the, if matt can break it break it down into numbers he gets very excited yeah, yeah. well you know, one i will say one thing about feast for crows we should we should talk about is what's not in the feast for crows because this is the first time we don't have daenerys john or Tyrion. Uh, which is and, a lot of what people don't like about the book like let's be honest like those are the povs people the, they're the main ca ca characters in a lot that's of a good ways. point Mm -hmm. um, but geographically they're just not there and we know that the book was split geographically because they had to split the books but also uh, Daniel Abraham who's co-author of The Expanse uh, was the one that actually suggested the geographical split and I personally I, like after many many years of talking about it because we talked about the five year gap what George had considered uh, doing at one point but I think if you were going to split it I think that this works and, and in some ways does it not put more light on these other POVs, like it kind of elevates them, at least in my mind, uh, especially for me, Samuel Tartley, uh, which on my first read through, I hated Sam. And then afterwards <laughs> I loved, Oh, I dude, I thought Sam was so annoying. I was like, what? Just quit complaining, Sam. <laughs> but you start to realize that Sam is a hero and Sam is doing heroic things despite who he is and what people think about him. And, and, it's almost the most fantasy of, of a song of ice and fire, right? Like the coming of age underdog uh, story. Like that is Samuel Tarley. It just happens to be that George isn't making him like lose all this weight and become muscled and chiseled and good with women. He just, he's just himself and still is able to do things that, that many will consider to be brave and heroic. So I, I actually, that was for me on the reread was the biggest thing was that Samuel Tarley became like MVP. Yeah, actually, it's funny you say that because I don't remember um, having an aversion to Samuel the first time I read through the series. But this time around, I was finding in the first three books that I just wasn't connecting to him as deeply as I was expecting. And then this book, I did. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I well, think he comes you're into right. his own a little bit more here. Mm -hmm. Like, he I think really he's a lot does. more tolerable uh, in, in this book. 
Um, yeah, I'm a big Sam Tarly believer. I actually, <clears throat> my, my crackpot theory and, and other people have speculated is I feel like he might be the one to take down Euron, uh, at old town during this big battle. I think it would be really, really cool. Or maybe it wouldn't be there. Maybe it'd be in a different time, but there, there's a whole lot of symbolism. Euron, Sauron, the eye patch, uh. one eye, all seeing eye. And then you look at, um, the Charlie house banner. And he's also good with a bow. It's like the one thing he's mediocre at in, in mm. martial status is the fact that he can shoot a bow. And then you look at his house sigil. It's a man with a bow. It's like, well, oh, maybe, maybe he puts yeah. an arrow through the eye. Was he good with the bow? I thought that he Sam. Well, yeah, no, he was. He was okay at the bow, which for him is good. That's <laughs> that was kind of the joke. It's like it's the only thing you're not completely dog shit at is shooting the bow. Yeah, <laughs> and most of his victories seem to be by accident in a way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, happens. Stan. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, like themes of, and you can kind of feel book, that that um, he's becoming a man, which is cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I, you were mentioning uh, Jimmy identity, and so I think th as far as themes, like that is actually a huge theme in this series because, especially in a feast for crows, Arya and Sansa are trying to get rid of their Stark identity. Like they're both trying to get rid of that. Uh, Samuel even is trying to take on John's advice of like not putting himself down or not having a self-deprecating comment about himself, being Sam the Slayer. Uh, and then um, there's another, oh yeah, with Catelyn, she's like, I'm a Lannister, I'm Tywin's daughter. <laughs> Just her trying to to put that in her, you know, mindset all the time. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting, it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, because this, this book is also <laughs> where we see, we see the shift, right, of it's Sansa to Elaine and mm -hmm. this is where we get like the cat of the canals chapter and things like that with Arya too uh, which is interesting if you kind of follow them along throughout each book like they have like pretty parallel stories obviously they're happening in different ways mm -hmm. but like their progression is kind of on like a parallel path yeah yeah I think so especially like just uh, paying attention to the inner mo monologues because a lot of times, like I noticed, um, Arya would just constantly, and of course she's doing this because of what she's trying to accomplish, but she's constantly saying, I'm no longer Arya Stark. That's not who I am. Who are you? Um, <laughs> and she's trying to fight against that ad identity. Say that's not, that was another person. That was another person. She keeps trying to disassociate. And Sansa, Sansa does the same thing in her inner di dialogue. She's like, that was some other girl who would be afraid to come down the eerie. Um, I'm no longer that girl. I'm Elaine now, like just constantly trying to push away their former self. Um, so it is interesting that it is kind of parallel. I didn't see it until like the end of this book. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> They're both really trying to, to get after the same thing. Yeah, because because Jimmy and I obviously we so we read, you know, the chapters every week. But you know, as sort of like a song of ice and fire theorists, right. Uh, you know, it's like typically when people go back to do like the deep dive theories that you find on YouTube and Reddit, it's pretty much always from like a point of view perspective is the way they do it. Where they're like, well, we're going to do it. It's like, they would focus on like a John theory. So they're like, they're diving into all the John chapters, but when you actually read it, like each chapter back to back, you pick up on all of these things that George is actually writing and you know it's like something that happens in this chapter happens in this chapter even though they're two totally different characters but it's like a very similar thing is taking uh you know is, is taking place like right now just because we just did it in a storm of swords and it happens throughout the whole series but um you know jamie right now in a back at where we're at in a storm of swords is cuffed right he's he's handcuffed and he's uh, brianna tar's prisoner and he's talking about how his wrist is hurting right and it's like, well, because, well, we know here in a little bit, he's about to lose that hand. Right. And Tyrion, then we cut immediate to a Tyrion chapter where Tyrion is rubbing his nose and Tyrion just lost his nose. But it's also like he didn't just lose his nose. Tyrion sort of lost like his a little more of his pride and his identity and everything. And you find that in the whole series as well. But yeah, as we were saying, you definitely find it here, too, with Arya and Sansa becoming sort of new people. They have to now shift into these like new roles and things like that. And then it's just something you pick up totally on. You just pick up a lot better 
reading it chapter by chapter, even though it's happening to different people. Yeah. Do you find that your experience has changed reading it chapter by chapter? Has that uh, enhanced your experience of the series? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Because the first time I read A Song of Ice and Fire, I did actually kind of read it POV wise, where I kind of actually because like so I the first time I read it was when the show like I, I, I started getting it, reading the books after the show was in like season five or six as when I was like, I'm going to do it. And so I kind of already knew what happened up to that point to where we were in the books. And I just done a bunch of like Reddit deep dives and Wikipedia deep dives to be like, all right, look, what kind of happens differently in the books as opposed to the show? So I kind of had like a, a knowledge base in it. And then I was going through the book. So I got to about really a feast for crows. And then I was like, oh, yeah, there's no Jon Snow chapters in this. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I'll just read the characters that I want to read. So I did like Cersei and Arya and Sansa. And I actually kind of skipped a lot of the other characters. I've since obviously gone back and listened to uh, read them all. Um, I do audiobooks, So really listen, listen to them all. But um, yeah, so it, it is it is such a different di uh, way doing it now this way. The like chapter by chapter because you just pick up on all of these tiny little threads that he carries over in like in each chapter like even the small stuff like jimmy we had like there's two chapters back to back where there was like songs playing right it was like the bear and the maiden fair in one and then another one and another and it's just like and there but they're it's just so his his level of detail is so absurdly deep it's it's no wonder it takes him 15 years to write a book yeah, he's very purposeful of the way he structures his chapters as well. Like you'll see <clears throat> kind of like what you were saying, Matt, like you'll see themes carry over to the next POV, but even sometimes just phrases that are mentioned. And I think going chapter by chapter slowly, uh, you don't forget your last chapter while you're reading your current chapter. If I feel like more refreshed, I guess, uh, doing it a chapter a week. And also when you're not worried about what's happening next and you're worrying about why things are happening, I think that's where a lot of the things become unlocked that, that make this series special. And I hear some people, you know, in the fantasy community, they'll, they read a lot of fantasy books and they read and they go, eh, you know, I thought it was okay. I don't see what the big stink is. And I'm like, yeah, but you're not like, you don't have to reread it, but like if you take the time right. with it and, and and are willing to come down to its level to engage, I think that that's where you can see uh, quite honestly why it's so special. And in my opinion, the best fantasy series, uh, George is very purposeful. And Johnny, I remember you said something to me while you were reading this because I was asking you for updates and you said that you let this book tell you when to read it, which I thought was really telling about your experience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, specifically with um, A Feast for Crows. And it's interesting because I think A Storm of Swords is longer, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they think that's a longer word count. Mm -hmm. But with A Feast for Crows, I did end up taking my time with it. And it was a really interesting reading experience for me because I found that um, there, were some, there were some days when I would just read for hours this book and just feel like I couldn't put it down. And there were other times where I felt like I just had to slow down. And it's not that the book was any less captivating whenever I did slow down. It was more like it just started to tell me, I don't want to be rushed. I want you to take my time with it. <laughs> I was joking to Jimmy. I'm like, I'm starting to feel like my books are, I'm anthropomorphizing my books and they're starting to talk to me and tell me things. So this book is like, I just, it didn't want to be rushed because he was setting up so much and it's not even setting up, it's developing. He was developing things. Like every chapter felt, I don't know. It felt like he was developing the, he was developing the world more. He was bringing forth more parts of the world for one, but also bringing forth so many different side characters. And sometimes it was happening all at once. And that did have to, that did force me to slow down. Like, okay, who are the members of Cersei's new council? <laughs> who are the, uh, the pre protectorate at the Eyrie? Um, I had to like slow down to take in those names but then when I did slow down and like really try to follow what was happening, then it just kept, I don't know, it just felt hypnotizing. Like I said, it just keeps using that word because it just felt like it drew me in even more. So it was weird because it was captivating and I felt immersed. And at the same time, I just felt like I had to slow down. And I know some readers 
they see that as a bad thing. I don't see that as a bad thing. For me, I feel like that just lent to the experience. It's like tasting a really fine wine or, you know, enjoying a really delicious gourmet meal. Like you're going to appreciate it more if you just take the time with it. So I feel like I had to do that with this book. Whereas with the Storm of Swords, um, it's interesting with the Storm of Swords because like when I finished the book, I tried to write down how many climactic moments happened in that book. <laughs> and I came up with like, it was so funny because I was in a live show for this and I came up with about 14 and then I realized I forgot about Danny's chapters. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> my goodness, there were so many climactic moments in that book. So in that way, it, it was just a different reading experience. Um, I didn't feel like it needed to, it didn't require that of me, the, the way that A Feast for Crows did. But I still, I think overall, I still been kind of taking my time with these books. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the, it's, a feast is definitely interesting in that. So I actually just pulled up the word count here too. So technically, a feast for crows word wise is actually two thousand words longer than a Game of Thrones. So I always assumed that it was the shortest book, but technically, a Game of Thrones is is actually shorter. But it's Game of Thrones has like seventy three chapters, as opposed to here with just uh, just under fifty. So that is so you definitely the characters you get you definitely get a much deeper dive. Mm -hmm. In, into which is one of the reasons actually my favorite well i guess my favorite stories in the whole series is actually the night of the seven kingdoms the duncan egg tales uh, is by I far i haven't read favorite. those yet <laughs> yeah is that it looks like you might have the book is that it? i do there? i, have it on the I, shelf. I, I think yeah. i see it right there yeah but um yeah oh it's it's so it's so good i mean if you if you really like a feast for crows i think you'll probably love it because it's just two characters really and you're just with mm -hmm. them the entire time and it's it's what it's one of the things I loved about it because I think also a feast for some people I think it, the momentum kind of stops a little bit because you've been following this certain group of characters and then like you know Bran John Tyrion aren't even in it and you know Jon Snow especially with the show I think you know when I was sort of reading it for the first time and I was really you know, into the show and we didn't know how any, anything was going to happen. And it was like, well, John was my favorite character. I was like, well, John's not even in this book. So I was like, all right, well, okay, well, I guess I'll just, <laughs> you know, like, I'll just give ahead, right? So I think, you know, I think, because I, if I had to guess, and I just think, you know, from knowing some of the things, I think on Reddit, I feel like, and some of these other communities, I feel like a feast is the one that gets kind of knocked the most. It, it of definitely all of the books. is. It yeah. definitely is. And, and, you know, again, you have to follow up the highest climax, maybe in the fantasy genre. I mean, that's a very difficult thing to do. But, um, you know, whenever I was in pro wrestling, uh, you didn't want to do big move, big move, big move, big move and never let anything breathe. Like you have to control the tempo and the pace of this thing. Um, and by doing those slower moments or, or a slower book, the next time that you crescendo is going to have even a bigger impact. And I also think that Feast for Crows makes Storm of Swords a better book because he deals with the trauma of a lot of the things that happened from the Red Wedding and the fallout of that and in a post-Civil War Westeros is what it is, right? With the still looming threat of like a Stannis Baratheon from the North. And the North is also being, to, being ruled by the Boltons instead of the Starks for the first time ever. That's a, that's a huge geographical, geopolitical switch, switch up, right? Uh, so I just think that there's a lot of challenges that a feast for crows, uh, answers, and it does it in a much more quiet way than a storm of swords, but it's still so, so, so good. And one of the things that happened in the fallout of the war is people dealing with, uh, the trauma and their obsess, their obsessive nature about things that they think are answers or possible next, um, uh, follies. Even Cersei is obsessed with with everything that's going on around her, bringing her down, losing her power, not being in control, which ends up actually her spite puts her out of control, <laughs> which, yeah. which is really interesting. Uh, Jamie is obsessed. If Cersei is banging moon boy, which I mm -hmm. think she did. Uh, <laughs> um, and then you also have Brienne who is obsessed with trying to fulfill her oath to Catelyn Stark and find Sansa. Uh, and in those things, those people are so obsessed with their goals that they end up missing things that are right in front of them, which is crazy. Brienne misses the hound, uh, who we think is the grave digger, possibly. Uh, Jamie misses the fact that Tom, and, Tom of Seven Streams is a mole for Lady Stoneheart. 
and is there as essentially uh, on an espionage mission. And Cersei is missing the fact that she is losing control to the faith because she is so paranoid and obsessed uh, with planning on every next move. So I think obsession and infatuation is definitely a big theme in Feast for Crows as well. That's amazing. And he manages to do that without making any of these characters one note. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're still very nuanced and at the same and complex and distinct, but they're, I don't know. There, there's just so many layers there at the same time as they are obsessed with their missions. That's such a good point. I missed that about the grave digger. Somebody did hint at me. They said, look out for the grave digger. And I did notice the grave digger, but I couldn't figure out who he was. So that would make sense. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> not confirmed, sense. but the theory is that, you know, yeah. in the show, he was um, the hound. So, uh, some okay. people don't love that, though. Some people think that the Hound, the way he left, was perfect. Some people don't <clears> love <throat> him to come back. But I actually think Clegane Bowl does happen in the books. That's a hot oh, take. It's, it's 100, I, yeah, I 100% think it's going to happen. And I think that the Hound is the Grave Digger, and it's going to be much earlier than it was in the in, yeah. in the show. I think he fights his brother, for sure. Yeah. Just um, set up. So what do you guys... So one of my... I mean... As we talked a little bit more, this book is definitely a little more central because we don't actually really geographically jump around all that much. So like, you know, I've talked about like we talked about POV reads. You can read this. You can read a lot of this series by specifically reading a POV character. And by far the easiest character to read in the entire series is Daenerys because Daenerys in like a Game of Thrones, I find myself, you know, now that I've read, you know, originally Daenerys is the character I cared the least about because like everything is happening in Westeros and then you are going over to the Daenerys chapters and they just feel so far removed from everything else because it's like none of this has literally anything to do with her until you really get into really you get into a storm of swords because even in a clash of kings it's like once Barris and Selmy shows up over there it's like okay now I feel a little more connection but I mean, what do you guys think about that, too? Like this book has a, has a kind of unique feel to it because we don't really go over to Essos like pretty much at all, except for like, you know, that one Aria chapter. Yeah, so I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts, Joanna, since you just read the book. I think you're probably fresher than me. Yeah, I mean, we are in Dorne, right? So yeah, I guess we do get some perspective outside of that and in Old Town. Um, so I guess I did, I just felt like that was kind of taking the place of what we saw with Danny's chapters, but that is an interesting point too, because I, I was thinking that it's so strange because I didn't feel that way at all. The first time I read, I kind of feel like very similar to how I was just saying about Simul Tarly. Um, the first time I read the books, I was just obsessed with Danny's chapters and this last, uh, this reread so far, it took me a while to get into her storyline for some reason this time around. Uh, but I found her, yeah, I thought it was interesting though. I think that he, I think that uh, either way though, I think Martin, when he does do develop other parts of the world, whether it's beyond the wall, whether it's in Dorne or whether it's in even Old Town or um, Essos or wherever, I think that he has a way of, of developing culture and uh, perspective there in a different way that I think is so is is so incredible to me because I think that Westeros alone is such an incredible um, has such incredible variety in that landscape. So just to show different cultures in different places, I I appreciate how he does that. Yeah, I mean this is a this is a book prim primarily about the south of Westeros, right? Like this is all the fallout from there, which is where the war probably hit the hardest. Uh, I think that's why this book feels maybe a little bit more quiet and maybe a slower pace book because there is something that you can accomplish by jumping to Essos or beyond the wall. You know, it's a complete context switch uh, for a lot of readers, especially people who are reading the book quicker uh, than we are at, you know, a chapter a week on our 80th read or whatever. So I, I think that it's, it's maybe a little bit of a bigger challenge to keep maybe someone who isn't a big, big fantasy reader or a reader at all to be enthralled in something that is taking place primarily in the Southern geographical locations. I, I love the Dorn stuff, by the way, I think it's really, really strong. Uh, and that was one of the biggest goffs of the show is that they just completely fumbled Dorn uh, 
terribly, uh, which is really, really unfortunate. Yeah. No, I loved the Doran chapters as well. Mm -hmm. And as far as like Westeros, um, even in A Feast for Crows, I would say you're starting to see still some aftermath of things in previous books. And you see how hard the people have it. All the corpses everywhere. Yes. And uh, how much, I mean, there's even a line at some point in the book about how when people in power make their choices, it's the people who have less that suffer the most. And yet at the same time, he flips that perspective, which I always appreciate a flip, where uh, Littlefinger is talking to, to Sansa. It's one of my favorite parts in the book because he's telling her about, he's kind of teaching her about the game in a way. And he's telling her that uh, that something that Cersei overlooks is that even the middlemen and the smaller, quote unquote, smaller players can have a significant effect on how things, the outcome of things. That Cersei's just thinking from the position of power. And what I could do is in my position of power, nobody can get me and not and really underestimating so many other players on the board. Mm -hmm. And she's filled her council with them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's wild. Wow. Yeah. So have you ever, um, you know, it sounds like it's been a very good while since you've read uh, dance with dragons, but mm -hmm. have you heard of uh, boiled leather, which is the, which is the way a lot of the Song of Ice and Fire fans read this and A Dance with Dragons together. Have you heard? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that kind of happens in A Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons is because of the split. Obviously, some characters' stories exist in A Feast for Crows, and then when you start, when you jump in, and you, you're about to uh, go, when you start, when you jump into A Dance with Dragons, you're kind of like, well, hold on a second. Some of these events. <laughs> timeline wise don't add up because like so for example the first john snow chapter is where john tells sam all right you need to go to old town because i need to figure that out well we already have that with sam where sam's now talking to lord commander john snow so that's like really that I, I still i have to i need to dive into more to see but i think it's the only time you ever get like the same in the same moment in time taking place in two separate chapters yeah but so you're like, well, hold on. Didn't he already do that? So like the timeline, because you now we jump back to these characters. So they fans have broken it down and you actually can read them like in parallel. And it's because like some of the events at the end of A Feast for Crows would be happening, you know, at like the beginning of some characters in A Dance Dragons. So they've actually like moved it all together to make it to like one big book, which is what it's supposed to be. Of course, then Winds of Winter, if we ever get it. We'll have some of the chapters that were supposed to be in <laughs> Dance of Dragons that are now going to be moved over there, too. So because of how long it took him to write this and it got split up, like the timeline is getting a little jacked up uh, in this. But it is it, when you get to the when you start reading the Dance of Dragons, especially the early chapters, pay like pay attention to that because you're like, huh, the timeline doesn't exactly add up here. Yeah. Yeah. I think he, ex he explains that too in the author's note at the end. Too. He gives like a warning yeah. kind of like, Hey, these are not all sequential. You have to think about the timeline in a different way. And I imagine that's also another really jarring thing because it was very much like in the moment, here comes one thing, another, another, another. Uh, we didn't have to worry about timeline stuff very much uh, in, in the first three books. So I think that that's another hurdle that feast for crows tackles. And then by hopefully it answer dragons, you're, you're maybe ready for that. Um, with all the warnings and whatnot. So uh, boiled leather is something I'm very interested in. Uh, me and that's Matt. How, that, have, that's how we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah we, I think we're going to go check. I've never done it that way. Yeah. I was so, wondering about that. And I was asking some people about that. Like if, because it seems like, I mean, if you're not too sensitive for, to spoilers, I mean, there is a way you could probably reread these books just POV by POV, right? Oh, yeah. Especially mm -hmm. Daenerys, you know, her being so separated. You definitely can do it. The hardest one, and me and Matt have talked about it, is, is like Sansa, because sometimes she's featured uh, in Arya chapters, for instance. Like, that, that that's a very common thing. Right. So, well, that's how uh, my Jon Snow breakdown initially started, was because <clears throat> nobody's really ever done it. And I want to put together a big sort of like recommended reading order because if you because there's a lot of characters that aren't even don't even have pov so if you want rob stark's story it's mostly told in catlin chapters so i'm working on this like huge breakdown where i just like every time a character is mentioned or whatever but yeah so like sansa 
is very much in Eddard chapters and a Game of Thrones and Arya chapters. And then she sort of shifts over to Tyrion, where she's in a lot of Tyrion chapters. So if you just go through and read her POV, you're going to miss out on like, you know, 70 percent of her actual story. So that's one of the difficult things, <clears throat> excuse me, about POV characters, with pretty much the exception of Daenerys. Daenerys is by far the easiest to just read. Bran, too. Mm -hmm. Bran is very easy to read just as his own character. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I really wanted, uh, wanted to ask you about since you're reading Feast for Crows, what did you think of the prologue? And what did you think of the final chapter of the book? I was, I was going to ask you because <laughs> I was so confused. Um, so. Obviously, uh, obviously, there's there are characters, you know, we're returning to the prologue uh, in the last chapter. And I'm so confused about who Sam is talking to at the end, because that's the perspective that we followed in the prologue. So the the interesting thing about that prologue is that we see Pate, right? Um, yes. Uh, and Pate ends up getting a coin from the alchemist and he bites it to see if it's real. And then he dies. He's poisoned. Mm -hmm. But in Sam, the last chapter is Samuel chapter. He uh, he Pate's there. Pate, Pate is alive. Uh, so the theory is, and I, I think this is pretty much confirmed. Uh, it's a faceless man. It's Jack and Hagar. Okay, that's that's that was actually my guess, just especially with the coin. Um, mm -hmm. That makes sense. And uh, you know, it's a very interesting thing that a faceless man who had to have been hired because they don't really do anything out of their own motivations, at least not that we know of, uh, is in the Citadel. And there, there's a lot of important information in the Citadel uh, and, and, and in an old town in general. There's a lot of history there, so. It's very interesting that there's a faceless man there. Who sent them? What are they after? The glass candles, they're burning. Who, who knows? Uh, yeah. Very, very interesting. And then we also have um, Alaris, which is known as the Sphinx, which most people think is uh, Solera from Dorne, which I would say is pretty much. Solera? Okay. Yeah, Sorella, there is some... Sorella Sand. Yeah, Solera Sand, who is one of Oberyn Martell's uh, bastard daughters, known as the Sand Snakes. They they mention that there's a sister, and she's off playing games. Oh, and Alaris. Because it's backwards. Yeah, it's Alaris and Sorella. Sorella Sand. Yeah. Sorella. Sorry, I might have said it wrong. Yeah. Um, but uh, Alaris backwards is Sorella. Oh wow, yeah. <laughs> that just blows my mind. Um, so Alaris. <laughs> Is it? But isn't Alaris? Alaris is a female. Alaris is is presented as a male and presented as a male. Yeah. So here's the thing, because I read on the ebook, I happen to notice the description of Alaris in the at the last chapter as having a widow's peak and black eyes, and I thought that was like that seemed familiar to me. And sure enough, that description was in the prologue, but it was also. In um, one of Aryan's, how, how you say her Arianne. name? Arianne. Arianne's chapters, where she said that she had this dream of somebody taking her away, and it was a man with a widow's peak and black eyes. Bingo. You got it. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh. Nice. <laughs> Yay. I finally caught something. <laughs> well, those, are, those are little details because some people, you know, who are, who usually don't like partake in the fan. I'm like you guys are digging in and, and you guys are looking at stuff that it's like, but it's there. It's, it's like, no, it is a hundred percent there. And that's why it's, the it is so long to write. It is. Yeah, yeah it is. It is a song of ice and fire is so crazy because the deeper you dig, I mean, Jimmy and I have read it hundreds of times. I mean, and every, there's still always something new that we like never pick up on. Yes. Like it's always like, wow. Like it's still to this day, like my mind blown by, by something. Yeah. I, I'll, so this is a, a pretty neat theory and I don't think I've talked about this on the show yet. Um, but my last read through the Tom of seven streams being a mole inside river run that leads to that caravan that gets Jamie sends out that has Jane Westerling in it, who is Rob's ex-wife. Um, I, I never put all that together. That, that Tom seven stream is probably leaking the information to the band of uh, the brotherhood without banners and that they're attacking essentially like they're raiding. Um, one of the things that I've thought about, but I, I I've never really put two and two together is do you all think that Jane Westerling is pregnant with Rob's heir? Because the timeline, the timeline works out and Jamie says like, are you pregnant or it like is it's question. And there's never an answer from her. 
I'm just saying, I think Jane Westerling might have Rob's heir, which would make the books infinitely more interesting than what happens in the show. Right. Cause she's stabbed at the red wedding in the show. And it's this, you know, well, it's not even the same character. Yeah. It, it honestly, I personally, I feel like they over dramatized it in the show just with that little bit. Like I think her being alive is way more interesting and she might have Rob's heir mm -hmm. and she has Rob's will, which supposedly names Jon Snow as heir to Winterfell, which is, I mean, how can someone say feast is not cool? <laughs> There's <laughs> yeah. so much there, right? I think a lot of these uh, things will be answered and built upon in the winds of winter. And I think like, just like storm of swords makes clash of Kings, a better book, right? I think that the winds of winter will make a feast for crows better in retrospect too. So, yes. So I had that same thought when I read it the first time, when I read the books the first time, I'm like, do we really know she's not pregnant? Um, because we get this confirmation from her mother. And her mother is so untrustworthy. Like, who knows what side she's really been on the whole time? Like, it's yes. still questionable to me whether she really was scheming with the Lannisters or with Tywin. I mean, mm -hmm. and she might have been, but I don't know. What do you all think about that, by the way? <laughs> I, I, I think I think her mother was. Um, her mother I think Jane Westerling is another tragedy, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And that's, it is so sad because obviously Jane really did love Rob. I believe that. Um mm -hmm. Now, I wondered about that, too, because, okay, so Edmer Tully, his wife, Rosalyn, is it Rosalyn? I think it's Rosalyn. I think it's Rosalyn. Um, she's pregnant, and they know she's pregnant. So I wonder, is she showing at this point? Because that would have been the same timeline as well. Ooh, that's a good idea, too. That's a good question. That's a very good question. Now, it's possible. And yeah, I mean, I think that's the only thing that disconfirms it for me, because I know when Jamie... And this is kind of a little bit contradictory because when uh, Catelyn talks about Jane, <laughs> she makes the comment in her mind, she has good hips for childbearing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then later on, when Jamie is observing Jane, she, he says, well, you know, she's nothing to lose a kingdom over, but she has narrow hips and big boobs or something like that. And I'm like, narrow hips, you know, that's, I thought she had bigger hips for Oh, well, so. there is a there is a theory because Jane Westerling has a um, I believe a sister or a cousin. I, I'm, I'm blanking on it right now that looked just like her. And this is mentioned back in like, a, I think, a storm of swords. And she's not present in feast. And people ah. feel like maybe Jane has been like ushered out by Tom Seven Streams, possibly like there, there's a big theory with that as well, because you're right. It is a contradictory um, description. I've also seen, I've never seen the interview, but I've heard people that George acknowledged that he messed up, but because oh. yeah. George, George definitely, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting things if you really, and in the community, we, they call them so spake Martins. Cause it's, you know, it's like, it's whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's almost like, it's almost like this rule that like exists, you know, like in the, when you're ever going to dive into a song of ice and fire theories, you always have to go check like anytime George says something, because like early in a game of Thrones, there's a scene where Tyrion like does this like tumbling thing. He does like a handstand or, you know, or yes. something. And everyone's like, well, hold on a second. So then George had to like write in this like whole little bit in Tyrion's backstory about like, well, he once hung out with this like circus folk because it was part of like a troop. And he decided yeah. basically he was going to have him almost be like a jester type character. Mm -hmm. And then, cause a lot of the plans have changed, right? There's mm -hmm. a famous horse that changes gender from book one to book two, I believe. And people were like, Oh, it's not the same <clears> horse. And, He's so he's always been a very upfront when he messes up. He's like, guys, stop talking about this. This is me being an idiot. One of the more interesting things that somebody mentioned was Lemongate, which Joanna, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Lemongate. Okay. So a lot so. of yeah, a lot of people said, well, that was a mistake. And someone said, Is it significant that lemon trees don't grow in Bravos? And he said, I would say that's pretty significant. Yes. And it's like, oh snap, like there is something <laughs> to that. Like we figured it out. So so Spake Martin is is great. Sometimes it crushes yeah. our theories. Sometimes <laughs> it reinforces them. Yeah. And the only reason I paid attention to the hips part was like, well, some women don't show, you know, as much right. as other people when they're pregnant. So that was the only reason I was thinking about that. Um, yeah, it is interesting, though. My goodness. There are so many interesting things like that. Um, but that's interesting, too, about the Tom 07 or the, the singer that he sends with them. Because I think that 
it's after he sends that group to Castor Lee Rock that he rec- he learns about another group with the the other guy, I cannot remember his name, the guy who was horrible and a joke, who ended up getting killed by the bandits. Oh yeah. Um I'm forgetting his name as well, but I know who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And so he was saying like that, that that actually had fewer people, I think, in the group. And so to know the bandits could take over a group like that, it kind of seems like, oh well then there this other group I just sent is probably I think it was like implied that this other group that I just sent out was even less safe. Um hmm, fascinating. Yeah, you can kind of see the rebellion working. And there's a lot of people who speculate that from the Feast for Crow storylines that the wedding between, I believe, a Lannister and a Frey that's going to happen at River Run they're talking about is going to be Red Wedding 2.0, but flipped. And that a large amount of Freys will be extinct uh, after. Which, honestly, if any house ever deserved to go extinct, it's the it's the goddamn Freys. I yeah, well, that. they're damned. <laughs> oh, they're yeah. damned. Yeah, they're damned. Yeah, yeah, and it's likely to be different than the way it goes down in the show. I think we should uh, name this podcast episode, Matt. I think we should name it "In Defense of Feast for Crows." <laughs> <Is it laughs> I mean, I mean, we could. I mean, again, it's. I think Feast is pretty much. You know what? We I, we ran a poll. I'll go take a look at our poll on YouTube. It's definitely. See, but... uh, it's the lowest rated on Goodreads. Oh, um, I'm sure. Right, yeah. but I have. Found I think it's just because it's it are always just, way higher on it. It's the short amount. It's because it's the shortest amount of chapters, and it doesn't include, you know, Jon Snow, Tyrion. Or... It's the biggest shift in in tone. It is themes, even, uh, and then also the approach to the narrative and the structure of the POVs. It ha- it had a lot of hurdles to overcome, and I I, st- I still hold hold it pretty near and dear to my heart. And I think on reread, the final two books are much uh, more interesting because they're mm-hmm. so different from the show. Like there is no Lady Stoneheart in the show. And that is one of the biggest uh, variables that we have. Uh, so here, I'll I'll add it to the screen here just for a quick second. So we ran a poll. This was a couple months ago. So a uh, favorite Song of Ice and Fire book at about 5,000 votes. Yeah, Game of Thrones was number one. Dance was number two. Storm was number three. Crazy. That's what? surprising. Uh, and then Clash of Kings at six and then Feast at five. I wonder if if um, the fact that these are split volumes in the UK and the European markets has anything to do with this because a lot of people that have the split editions right. hate the first part of Storm of Swords because all the climaxes are in the back half of the book. Um, so A Song of Ice and Fire, I think, is six or seven books in Europe. Right. Which is really interesting. Um, the fact that Storm of Swords is that low is like mind boggling to me. It yeah, boggles my, my mind as well. Yeah. I mean, I, it's so popular <laughs> among <laughs> readers I know. It just and depends I mean, on who you ask, I guess. Right. But it's yeah, just technically really this, this was also during House of the Dragon that this poll went up. So there would have been, you know, more show because our, our YouTube algorithm is is like totally weird. We you know when like House of the Dragon is on, it's like, you know, huge flux of like new people that aren't really. And then we highlighted or... Laris's foot fetish and then we got a really weird. Yeah, you know, the like... algorithm went real weird there for a bit. <laughs> <It really did. laughs> we were like this on the Our, number one, our number one search ter- term and algorithm was like, you know, only feet. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it was rough. <laughs> rough couple it was, months it, there. It was, it was weird. A Storm of Swords is fascinating because like I said, there are so many climactic moments and I know oh, yeah. that this is something that I talked about with my read along group is that every single climactic moment feels earned. It feels like Mm -hmm. it's just brilliantly set up and just one right after another, it's just perfectly executed. um, Just like an amazing fireworks show or something. And then with, with the feast for crows, you were saying earlier, Jimmy, about how you get so much of the why I feel like a feast for crows really, really digs into the why behind so many things, so many characters that are, expecting one thing or trying to you know do one thing and then figuring out oh there was a whole different plot at play that i didn't wasn't aware of mm-hmm. um and i appreciated that so much i just found it so fascinating just you really see how smart how intelligent certain characters are and then <laughs> as we talked about with cersei before how intelligent she thinks she is but <laughs> how much <laughs> that really crashes down on her and on so many levels yeah she is not the schemer that she uh, she thinks she is, unfortunately no. for her. No. So, what did you guys? What did you guys? Uh, what do you think about the Brienne arc in this? Because that's probably the second biggest. Actually, actually, I think it is the second biggest arc in terms of 
uh, chapters in this in Brienne. this book. I also love where we're at with her in Storm of Swords right now, where she's like Usher and Jamie across, and you just realize that they're both, for all intents and purposes, by by the judgment of the people, that they're both Kingslayers is like because we don't think about Brienne like that. Like we know there was a shadow mm -hmm. baby, but in the eyes of the general like tavern owner, Brienne's Kingslayer. She killed Renly. And she has this title. She has the title. Jamie has two titles. He has he is a knight of the seven kingdoms and he's Kingslayer. And the one title she would want to share with him is a knight of the seven kingdoms. But instead, she shares Kingslayer. And it, what a relationship. And also Brienne in uh, Feast for Crows is a different person because of her experiences with Jamie. And I think it's it also dictates how she handles people as well. I just. I should let Joanna answer because she just read it, but I feel very strongly about Brienne. I think she's wonderful. Oh, she's amazing. She is an incredible character. And it's interesting because, I mean, while she didn't truly kill Renly, uh, that's such an interesting point that she's she's per perceived as a Kingslayer mm -hmm. alongside as Jamie is perceived as a Kingslayer. But whereas Jamie has let that reputation kind of make, it's made him bitter. It's made him bitter for sure. Oh, yeah. 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 And I, there's a lot to say about Jamie. I actually think Jamie is probably suffering PTSD from the things he watched Aries do, just seeing mm. people burned in front of him. But uh, with Brienne, I think like she, I don't know, I think she never lets that, she never lets that bring down her belief and courage and honor. And I don't know. And I, you could tell that that rubs off on Jamie too, because he believed, you know, he, he looked up to his mentors. He looked up to the people who came before him and mm -hmm. there was a part of him that believed in that, that still believes in that, but just keeps suppressing it because he's so bitter about everything that happened with that. But with Brienne, it is fascinating how she's changed. I have to say that in A Feast for Crows, since we've been talking about that book, it's fascinating when you read her perspective, because as she's going on this journey to find Sansa Stark and she's going through all these previous locations that she and Jamie went through in A Storm of Swords, she's like reliving the memories and that was where she and Jamie fought down the people who were yeah. shooting arrows at them. And, <laughs> and it's like, you could tell it's kind of romanticized in her mind now, like how she felt about, J how she feels about Jamie. You could tell that this is like almost like somebody pining for somebody, the way she keeps on reliving these memories. Um, and you almost question whether Jamie feels the same way about her, like whether he really cares about her. It seems like he doesn't give her a second thought until there's a chapter where somebody insults her, says, ah, ha, ha, this is where this the ugly Brienne of Tarth, you know, Brienne the ugly ended up fighting that bear or whatever. And Jamie ends up punching him. Like he, oh, <laughs> you yeah. can tell that he, he does care about her. Um, so it's, I don't know. It was, it's, she's such a fascinating character though, because like in A Feast for Crows, I mean, even when she gets half her face ripped off, everything, like nothing brings down her belief in, her honor. And I think there's something to be said for that. As much yeah. as people call this a grim dark series, and I can understand the argument for that, there's something about Brienne that just brings this gleam of light <laughs> mm -hmm. to the series, I think. Yeah. 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 You know, it's interesting. You brought up the chapter two where Jamie sort of defends her honor because we just did on our podcast, or, or still in early Storm of Swords, like I think it's the second Jamie chapter where. Uh, she calls Jamie Kingslayer and he sort of gets offended by it. Uh, and, but at the same time, he keeps calling her wench and she gets offended by it. Right. And so he's actually sort of, he's talking about, well, here, when I killed the bad king, he's like, I took off my white cloak and I put on my gold one. So I did it as a Lannister, not a member of the King's Guard. Mm -hmm. And then you just see that big shift, you know, from this from basically at the you know at the end of two books really because we're at the beginning of storms to the end of feast like how big of a shift it is because a lot really happens in these in these two books i mean yeah yeah between between these characters who we didn't even get point of views for before oh it's just a brilliant pairing that that those two together is one of the most brilliant pairings in all of fantasy i think i agree yeah i totally yeah. agree I mean, there's so much to be said about that. I have a question for you two about Jamie, because I know that he makes a big point about talking about that, about how he didn't wear the white cloak when he killed Ares. You know, he revealed himself as a Lannister, but also his bitterness about Ned Stark and the look that Ned Stark gives him in that scene when he's sitting on the throne. How do you all, uh, 
interpret that? Or how are we to interpret that as readers? Because I was wondering, is it is he mad about Ned judging him because Ned would have had to kill the king if he hadn't? Is that the idea there? I don't know. I think he feels like Ned is super ungrateful. And yeah. like one of the main reasons, because, you know, obviously Ares burned Ned's brother and father, mm -hmm. uh, essentially the, the ruler of Winterfell and its heir. And I think that he feels slighted by that. Like they're not even a wink and a, you know, hey, behind the scenes, like, thank you. Um, Ned Stark is so worried about his honor. It's almost like a toxicity of honor, right? Like it's, it's honors toxicity whenever there are no exceptions to anything, uh, which we know is not how the world works. So, and, and when you do that reread, I mean, I'm sure you saw in Game of Thrones, Ned is, is a buffoon. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I love Ned. <laughs> I, 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 I would name a son Ned, I think, after <laughs> after him because, you know, he's just so honorable, but he he's he, to a fault, to a fault, certainly. And I think it's just like, how dare you look down upon me for breaking my oath whenever like it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, mm. it's why that, it that's, that, that's why that, the scene in the show and we know that George obviously was way more involved in the show in like seasons one through four because um, even wrote a couple episodes which that's another thing that which is really crazy is go watch the episodes of game of thrones that george wrote because there's yes. like small things in there that like aren't in the books that he adds like the whole line of um aria saying aria and Sirio pharrell like what do we say to the god of death you know not today like george wrote that for the episode he it wasn't in the books but you know ooh, you know like that's something to like kind of like, is he giving us a tip is he giving us a tip that that may exist that may come to fruition in the show but there is a scene in game of thrones and in season one where ned stark is talking to jamie in the in the throne room that doesn't uh, that does not take place in the books where jamie's telling me he's like you know he's like he's like i was here when they killed your dad and everything and you know i felt like i gave them i felt like i gave them justice when i killed the mad king of course then eddard stark does not take it very well and he's like is that what you said when you stabbed him in the back you know like and, and so oh. and ned stark just tells him off essentially but damn it, ned. You, i know <laughs> you do sort of get that like in that moment in the show it does feel like jamie was trying to like at least somewhat offer you know like hey you know like i it sucks, you know, I, I kind of see it, but then it, you know, so like, I, like, I've always kind of viewed that as because obviously Eddard Stark, we don't, Ned Stark or Jamie really never references him again in the show, but obviously he does think about him in the books. So I always kind of viewed that as that, like the way of, we can pull some of that story forward a little bit while we actually have these two characters here and uh, do a little bit of that in the show. You know what else I think as readers, like a lot of people probably side with Ned and we like love Ned so much. And the reason is because as readers, we know Jamie shoved his son out of a window, but Ned doesn't know that. So I think we get like built in bias towards Ned during those thoughts and interactions that Jamie has, uh, because we know that information. And yeah. that, that's an interesting way of kind of thinking about why Ned is so beloved and Jamie, you know, we don't love Jamie till book four if we love yeah. him usually. So that's just another thing to think about is like, we get all the information. Uh, it almost feels like retroactively Ned's right <laughs> because you're right. like, yeah, you know, a, but we, we can't, we can't put that into the relationship because uh, Ned wouldn't have known. Yeah. It's so interesting how much um, George R. R. Martin, especially in the, I just, I noticed this so much more in a game of Thrones, but how much he uses children a moral decision like what well, would you kill one single innocent child to save the many you know and right. i mean it's, there's so much conversation about that with um with ned and robert about denarius and ned fighting to defend denarius and her innocence yeah. and then and yet like <laughs> jamie just without thinking pushes Brandon yeah because if not it, it all comes i mean one his family obviously is going to be in massive amount he's he's dead Right. He's he's being right. executed by Ellen Payne. Uh, you know, another example of this, though, is uh, Edric Storm. Edric Storm, Melisandre wants to sacrifice him yeah. for a good cause mm -hmm. right? because she has to King's blood. So, yeah, you're right. There is a lot of of, of that and a uh, man's Raiders baby. Yes. Mm -hmm. Damn. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, Sandra just wants to kill children. I, I don't get it. Yeah. She's, you know, and I think she's going to finally get to do it. She's going to burn Shireen in the winds of winter. 
And it's like, what's your obsession with killing these kids? I don't like, I don't yeah. get it. Yeah. Yeah, what, did you, what did you think about, um, cause obviously this is a character who there's really two characters from the books that aren't in the show that obviously like by far the biggest mass, most massive differences uh, between the show and the book. Um, and I think it's the, I think it's the epilogue of a storm of swords where Catelyn's body is pulled out of the river by the, by the wolf. Obviously now we have this character in a feast for crows, you know, lady Stoneheart. So like, what do you think is sort of about, we don't see her that, that much in, in, in this book, but we definitely do see her. I mean, what was, so what do you like just kind of thoughts on that character? Yeah, it's interesting because that's where I wonder if the show altered my memory a little bit. Because when I read the Stoneheart chapter in A Feast for Crows, I was like thinking, I just don't remember this chapter at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just don't remember it. Yeah. But I did remember, I did remember though, however, that um, the detail at the end of Storm of Swords that she gets dragged out and you know, that we essentially see her as Stoneheart. I did remember that scene. I just didn't remember um, her chapter in A Feast for Crows, which there's not very much. There's just a little right. bit. Uh, but I do remember when I watched the show, just being very disappointed. That, that was yeah. not developed. Yeah. So at the end of Storm of Swords epilogue, um, they hang a fray and it's Lady Catelyn. She doesn't say a word because her throat's been torn out and she just kind of nods to basically say, I was a witness to what this meant. Because Tom Seven's, Tom of Seven Streams is actually the guy who says, like, you are basically guilty because of the Red Wedding. And he's like, you have no witness. He's like, oh, but I do. And then it, like, it's the unveiling of, of Lady Stoneheart, essentially. Uh, and I think that moment is so iconic in the books. It's a damn shame. You know, you only get... You know, to even have a show adapted is a crazy thing as a book fan. But to miss one of those iconic moments is where you're like, Arr. like, I know you got to change stuff, but did you have to leave that out? Like, could, could we have not gotten zombie Catelyn Stark? Like, that would have been oh. really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I agree totally. Um, I had a question about singers actually from A Storm of Swords. So the singer, there was a singer scene where um, with Shay, Shay's favorite singer that oh we Tyrion just wanted it. that was the same one uh la no, no last we, week. we just uh, yeah oh. we just said that chapter yeah his name was simon silver tongue simon silver okay. yeah i just wonder whatever happened to him because i know that he sent Braun to do away with him i does Tyrion give him money and send him away I feel like he doesn't kill him. I feel like he's not killed or maybe it's left un unsaid, but essentially Tyrion says, go find him Bronn before someone else does. It says, oh. you know, so, so the word doesn't get out about Shay. Um, so I'm not sure. And I can't remember. I feel like maybe he just gives him a bag of gold and sends him on his way, but I'm not positive about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about that character. If he'd come back, but Simon seen him yet. Let me see. Simon Silvertongue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he does not. Uh, no. We don't. We don't see him. Uh, basically, Tyrion confesses to in a dance with dragons. Tyrion confesses to Penny that he had him killed. So that's it. That's basically it. So yeah, Ooh, okay. he's, he's he's gone. Yeah. Part of that villain arc. Yeah. yeah. Poor Tyrion. Mm. Yeah, I'm really excited, though, to read um, the next book, the A Dance with Dragons, just to go back to Danny, actually, because I feel like, um, obviously, the show frames what the, the idea is going to have, what, what idea Martin might have with that character. Mm -hmm. um, do you all, what do you all think about that? Uh, oh. we, <laughs> I, I will say this, so I can certainly see a, a, a possibility that it could happen. But when George gave Dan and Dave the five points, like the five, he called them like, I think, oh, shit moments is what he called them. That was not one of them. And Dan and Dave said that they had been planning for Daenerys and Jon's storyline in the final season since season four, where they knew they were going to start diverting from the books. Um, so I think that's a Dan and Dave in creation, to be honest with you. I think that was their spin on like what maybe a song of ice and fire was all about. And I think they missed the point, to be honest in the books. And you kind of touched on this, Joanna, it is very grim. It's very dark, but 
there's a lot of hope and there is there are heroes in a song of ice and fire like that's the, that is the thing that i think people miss when they talk about the work as a whole and how pessimistic it is there are heroes uh they might just not be the most obvious ones uh i'm of the belief that danny is absolutely key in fighting the white walkers and i think she will die in that service and i do think she will die underappreciated by the people of westeros i think she might be a villain or some kind of rejected i find that maybe fagon or you know young griff will maybe have the crown instead of her i don't think she'll sit the iron throne i don't think she's going to go mad like she did in the show uh and i i, I think that she's going to be a hero at least to us who have all the information yeah i yeah i, I agree and we we actually just we just talked about this too i think um uh yeah i think danny is gonna die essentially saving westeros and that she will be sort of you know like that's that's gonna be her arc because then it sort of makes it a little more somber where it's like okay you weren't actually you didn't get to sit the iron throne you didn't get a rule but you were actually like key in saving Westeros and it'll sort of give the Targaryen name this like you know it'll sort of right the wrongs of all the Targaryens because she doesn't want to be like her her dad she wants to you know be sort of a just and good leader like she is a marine like that's what she's really striving for over there she wants to you know get rid of the slavers and all of these things and when she does come to Westeros I feel like it's going to be ultimately she's going to sacrifice herself in some way um, whether it is just in battle against the White Walkers or whether it's like, you know, the real Jon Snow is Azor High and has to put the sword through the heart of his lover to unleash it, to be Lightbringer and all of that stuff. I, I don't know that it's going to go that way, but I think she will definitely die being like the one to save Westeros. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I that imagine just feels, that, just, that just feels much more like the way George would do it. Yeah, I think also with um, a song by Fire, it's like always good to keep in mind that her what George R. R. Martin has planned to do with her has probably changed like eight times. <laughs> but I don't see it in a world where you can sit down with the creators of a show and say, I have five major moments, oh shit moments, and one of them isn't that Danny commits, you know, mass murder. I, I just don't see how that's not one of those moments. And we know the five moments. So it's like, I, I, and it seems like it was a Dan and Dave creation. I mean, they talked about it. They said they were planning for that one. They knew they wanted to head towards that. Um, so I don't know. I, what I will say is we do cheer Danny's violence against other people. So is there maybe a time where Danny ends up using her power to punish people who don't agree with her? Yes. I think that could very well happen, Do I think she's going to burn a hundred thousand people to death. No, probably not. Probably not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Though I do think dragons are like a nuclear bomb of sorts in this world. So like certainly that power has to be overflexed at one point. But we're kind of we kind of see that in, in Dance of Dragons a bit, you know, where we see that Drogon uh, kills the the boy and they bring the dead boy's body to, to Danny. And then she decides to lock up the dragons because of it. So I think we kind of see how dangerous they are uh, early start too. so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just really curious about her character because I can see, I know that when the show came out, I was very much against (laughs) that decision at the end. I think as many people were. And at the same time, I had friends who were huge fans of the series. I had one friend in particular who'd read the series several times. She said, well, you can see, uh, you can see that rationale from book one. I guess she saw ways to see that, that Danny could possibly go mad. Um, And I think there are moments where, I think, wow, she makes some really, really harsh decisions. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. even with her brother, uh, even though her brother was horrible, the fact that she, she doesn't seem to mourn him at first, or at least almost seems to take joy in it a little bit. And I don't know, later on, she does seem to miss him though, but also her decisions in Marine in book three too. Uh, I thought those were pretty strong vengeance choices, almost mistaking justice for vengeance. So it did make me curious because this is the character that you see that didn't have a lot of agency to start out with, pr- practically no agency at all at the beginning of A Game of Thrones, mm. to build her character arc so much that by the end of A Storm of Swords, you see her have so much more agency and see through people who are trying to manipulate her. I loved the way that she, I know I've talked to you about this, Jimmy, like the way that she responded to um, to not Barristan, Jorah. Jorah. To Jorah Mormont, 
the way she would not let him try to build this codependent relationship with her. Uh, I thought it was brilliant the way that that happened, the way how self-aware she was. And, you know, she has prophecy, just like Cersei is living with this hovering prophecy of betrayal. Uh, Danny is as well. But at the same time, she still manages her way very well, in my opinion. I think she's just, like I said, incredibly self-aware, incredibly poised, incredibly knowledgeable or, or open, open-minded and clever. And so I just think it would be very tragic, speaking of tragic characters, if we came this far with Danny gaining agency and all this awareness and to see it come tumbling down for madness. I don't know. I'm not yeah. saying it's totally out of the realm of possibilities, but it would be very tragic in a way. Just yeah, thinking I, about how far that would come. I feel um, as if the dream of the Mummer's Dragon and people like parading it around and kind of supporting it. I could see maybe young Griff coming over, getting the crown. Because right now, let's be honest, Westeros is ripe for a new ruler. Yeah. Like it has been a bad, bad time for the last like five years. So a Targaryen coming back like, you know, I'm going to make Westeros great again. But it's not her. It's young Griff. And then she arrives and there's somewhere to get on the throne and the people love him. You know, he starts stabilizing the, the, the region. It's like, I could see that. And then her vengeance is on her people. Plus she's been told this whole time uh, by Jora and other people. I think embarrassing says this Illyrio definitely does. It's like the fact that there are a lot of people, your grace back home that would love that, that stow away their dragon banners and yada, yada, yada. So I think she sees that as like her and, and they're going to want her on, on the throne. But, Again, they've never had a queen in Westeros. So for her to be turned back because she was the second Targaryen to land and because she's a woman would probably rub her the wrong way. But uh, me and Matt have talked about it. We think that she is going to see the ex existential threat to the North as like her duty and that she is going to go and do these things. And maybe she does all of this in spite of young Griff taking her spot. And, you know, she's like, well, I'll go save their lives and show them. And then maybe she dies in that way. And it's very bittersweet. Right. Uh, I mean, who knows? I have no idea. Yeah, the, other, the other big difference is, is where that where that final where the where the final battle sort of takes place. You know, like the mm -hmm. the battle that should have been the final battle in the show took place in Winterfell. And they said, we have three episodes left. Now we're going to go move everything south. Yeah. And but that's there's also not fortune. even there's also not even a Night King character in the show in the books right yeah. like the though there is no leader of the white walkers in in the in the books so a lot of people think that it's going to end up being you're on Greyjoy or somebody you know with the that horn sam has that he finds in the little that they find a little cash and he's taken with them to the citadel might be the horn of winter that could bring the wall down right i mean it's like there's a lot of a lot of big pieces that still have to have to move because right now all we do really know about the white walkers in the books is that, or the others, they don't even, you know, as they m mainly call them in the books uh, is just that they're scary and crazy powerful. Like even, even at the end of a dance of dragons, we still don't have like a central white knight King type figure. Yeah. So it yeah. really depends on how it, how it all plays out. Yeah, and we've we've really? often speculated that Euron is the person who maybe not even lead them, but to aid them in trying to ruin the world. You know, you build, you tear the world down to become a god, which is Euron's whole thing. And that's what I'd love to hear, Joanna. Once you finish Dance with Dragons, your thoughts on Euron? Because yeah, <laughs> talk about a change from the a lot of, yeah, My huge god. change. Yeah, because a lot of people think he's going to be the final the final villain. Mm -hmm. mm, I'm and excited. The, I can't. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So how long have you been? Because uh, I know you're on your reread here. How did you? How long is it taking you to get through each book? Um, about a book per month, I think. Yeah. Maybe a little bit more than that. I started. No, I started in January, and I took. I took a bit. I don't know. I think I took a couple of months with. Or I took several weeks with uh, a storm of swords, and with this book, I took like the whole month of May. <laughs> I read right. it that slowly. So um, so I'm taking my time with it. I'm with a group of friends and we're reading the books together, having some live show discussions about them. And uh, yeah, we're just being flexible with our dates with this because you know, we want to make sure that we're enjoying the process and not trying to, yeah, to reread, right? be too hard right. about the deadline and everything. Yeah, definitely. 
and then you're still i mean i'm, I'm guessing for your because you obviously you because you and Jimmy know each other, uh, for those of you who've just been who been listening, I guess we didn't really give you the most proper introduction, right? You you're part of like the you and Jimmy, you're part of this like fantasy book <laughs> community on YouTube. There's so many of uh, you know, I I jump in and I've seen you obviously on a lot of live streams with Jimmy. I, I don't even know the books that you guys are reading. <laughs> <laughs> mainly just stick to a song of ice and fire i try to be funny in the chat and i just google something and be like i really agree with this point you know like <laughs> whatever <laughs> but are you so you're still i mean you're but i'm assuming you're still dive you're not just reading a song of ice and fire right now you're still reading a bunch of other stuff as well yeah i'm reading some other things as well um but actually for me i mostly read beast for crows honestly <laughs> i slowed down my reading a little bit in may and just really took my time with this book uh, but yeah, I have been reading other books at the same time as well. Yeah. And I'll probably take my time with the last book with the Dance yeah. of Dragons. <laughs> yeah, it'll probably be a couple months, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a big one. Yeah, it is. It's a big one. And I'll be hosting a live show for that on my channel. Nice. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, uh, all right. Well, Joanna, I guess, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, for coming on uh, really appreciate it and we, we've been trying to get you on here for a good while uh, I think we were planning on doing it earlier and then I blew up my back and I couldn't sit for like six months or three months <laughs> or however long it was because Jimmy was like hey I want to bring my friend on and I was like okay I just I can't really sit down for a long <laughs> a long, <laughs> a long thing yet so it's it's been crazy over here but um, yeah so where can people find you on the internet Sure. So my channel's name is Joanna, but you can find me with the handle Joanna Reads or Joanna underscore Reads. Um, that's probably the best place to find me. And then I'm also on Twitter under that same handle. Uh, I'm on Instagram at, at what resonates. Thinking about changing the handle. Don't know yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just keep keep it the way it is. Uh, but yeah, that's where to find me is mostly my channel. So I'm pretty active there, especially in the book community, as you mentioned, along with Jimmy. Uh, and just having a blast rereading the series. And I just can't stop gushing about it because, I mean, really, I think it's just, it's so immersive, incredible character work, best settings ever, uh, best plot ever, everything. everything about him. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest of all time. Amazing reread value. Yeah. Yeah. It's about as good as it gets. Yeah. And I'm just so honored to be here. So thank you guys so much for having me. Oh, I've been enjoying so your... I've been enjoying your podcast quite a bit. Just thinking, wow, I did not notice that level of detail yeah. <laughs> when I read that chapter. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy and I are super nerds uh, uh, with it. Yeah. But Absolutely. I love it. You know, it's funny because I was talking about this with Jimmy too. Like I, you know, with certain series, there are obviously different fandoms for different fantasy series and different conspiracy theories behind different series. But for some reason, I find it hard to get invested in all of those extra theories when it comes to other series. But with this series, I never get tired of hearing about those Easter eggs or those connections. I just never tire of it. It's so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. The, it, it is, the dive is just so, so, so deep. It's what it, it's what I it's I don't know. I have like ADD and I always have to I get really into stuff for like two weeks at a time. But for some reason, A Song of Ice and Fire, I literally just never get tired of. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the biggest thing is like, you know, when you read a book again, it's usually the book reads you is is the phrase that everyone uses. But I've changed my my mind on Daenerys's end two times in the last three years. You know, like the theories themselves, like you you come to them with a different experience depending on how your reread went and then doing like a chapter by chapter and then doing a POV and you know, you're always trying to reevaluate like what where your hat is hung when it comes to theories. And that's another fun part of it. So I just think all the extra speculation and theories ring true. And also that a lot of them are very open ended where they just garner discussion. And some of them we don't even need an answer for. Mm, I agree. So. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a big fan of somewhat open endings anyway. But I honestly, know. I can honestly say like I love this series so much. That even if, you know, heaven forbid, <laughs> the last, the next book that comes out, hopefully we're going to get it to winter, winter. Even if that book totally tanks, I still will love the series. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's still yeah. going to be one of my favorite series ever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll definitely we'll definitely have to bring you back on after you finish Dance of Dragons and have a big Dance of Dragons discussion. And then after that, you've got to dive into uh, A Night oh, of the I Seven am. Kingdoms. Yes. Because very interested to hear because it's a it's it is a different read 
than the others. And I highly, I don't know if you're, I think you're probably more of like a book book reader, but the audio book for that is next level. It is so amazing. It's actually the entire thing is narrated by Harry Lloyd, who plays Viserys, uh, not not uh, Daenerys's younger brother or older brother. Mm -hmm. He narrates, he narrates the whole thing and it is just absolutely amazing. So, so good at it. Um, so yeah, we'll have to bring you back on for that too. So, all oh, right. Yeah. Well, uh, all right guys, as always, thank you guys for watching on YouTube. Thank you guys for listening. We will be back next time with some chapter. I don't have pulled up in front of me. Aria three. Aria three. There or we two. go. Thanks. Uh, it's Aria something. <laughs> it's one of the Aria chapters <laughs> in a, in a storm of swords. We said it last week. So, uh, we will be back with that or three if you like our podcast don't forget to subscribe like us write a review leave a comment or send us a raven at btkcast at gmail.com or bend the knee podcast.com we will see you next time and remember that winter is coming <laughs>